There we go, look at that. Technology. Um, welcome to, to this. Um, very thankful for, uh, for Google for putting on this, this wonderful room um, because this track has just been an incredible uh, technology track. So very thankful I get to share uh, what to us at Stark Wayne is, is something that's been super important, which is um, both backing up and uh, the perhaps 90% more important task of restoring uh, data across uh, many, many data sources. Because um, Cloud Foundries itself doesn't have a lot of opinions about backups. Like, it's a good idea. Um, so perhaps, I don't know, read up on it. Um, and certainly when it comes to our users, uh, if you're a Cloud Foundry user and you like do CF help minus A, because first you'll type CF and you'll realize you get some commands, you'll do CF help and that gives you the same set and eventually you find the minus A flag and it gives you everything. And, uh, and you'll scroll through it and you'll be looking and then you'll go, oh, I'll just grep. I'll just grep. I'll try to find the command I'm looking for. And you'll do grep backup. And there's nothing. All right, all right. What about grep restore, grep archive, grep help? Um, Cloud Foundry CLI, Cloud Foundry service broker API, nothing really has anything of opinion about backups, um, which is a pretty bad point to start because um, cause, cause, um, if, if you can't, <laughs> it doesn't really matter even if you could back up because if you don't know how to restore, uh, you, 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 you're nowhere near close to having a system you can, uh, can love. And, and uh, so yeah, like, so like in the previous talk, we talked about uh, monitoring being like the base if you can't monitor. The same when it comes to production systems. If you can't restore, it's, it's nothing. It's not production, that's for, that's for sure. It's a toy. You can be excited that it works at all, but don't share it with your friends or people you hope to continue to be employed with. Um, so let's go back to that. So from a user's perspective, um, when I was doing my honors year, I'll tell you my quick disaster recovery. We all have these stories, and perhaps this is why I care about this so much. When I was uh, finishing my honors year, you know, you, you have a thesis to write, and it might be so many pages. You do not write them, you know, progressively throughout the year. You write them all at the end. And, um, and in 1996, uh, Microsoft uh, Word 95 was the thing to use. Okay, some people use LaTeX, but I had no idea how that worked. And so, um, but Word 95 really couldn't deal with big files. So even though my thesis is only 80 pages or so, you still broke it up into lots of chapters. And I was working happily on chapter three. This is how well I remember this. This is the pain that's about to come. It is burned into my skull that I was on chapter three. And I went to move to work on chapter eight. And chapter eight was not there anymore. And so I looked on, on you know, Windows Explorer and, uh, and all the chapters weren't there anymore in their separate little word ex word files, except chapter three, which was happily still there. And uh, so I was, I, was, I was on the assumption that, that we had backups. I, I certainly knew that we did because I'd been told, put everything on Z drive, that's the shared departmental volume that's backed up. So I'd done my job. And uh, it's a platform that the department offered. And uh, so I walked down the stairs to the IT department, uh, IT support group, and I said, can't believe it. You know, I've done so much work in the last 24 hours and uh, I can't believe I've lost all my files. Can you please uh, recover them? And that's when he broke the first piece of news. He said, well, actually, we do backups every two days. Oh, oh my Lord. The, I mean, I was already heartbroken for the amount of work I'd lost in the last 24 hours. Because you do know that the phrase daily backup is, is uh, polite code for 23 hours of data loss. Um, it sounds like a real phrase. Doesn't it? You hear it all the time. Daily backups. This man knows what he's doing. I'm going to another meeting. Um, so yeah, so two days. So we have 47 to 48 hours worth of data loss. This is pretty exciting because you know, literally a large amount of work was done. And then he looked at the backup drive because it was a thing, a physical thing. And he said, ah, oh, well, that's interesting. Nothing good's about to come here. He says, this hasn't worked for the last six times. <laughs> I'm down 14 days worth of work, which, to be fair, nothing good had been written 14 days earlier, uh, which would be the basis for continuing my professional career as a human. Um, and uh, 
and this had taken some time, and at this point, one of my, my peers um, had uh, skulked into the room, and he had a whole demeanor about him that suggested he was intimately aware of what was going on. And, um, and he said, I'm really sorry, but I thought this would be a lot funnier. He found my password and moved all the files to another folder. So anyway, it turned out really well. I've never spoken to him ever again. Um, <laughs> Nice to know where all my enemies are in one go. Like, but, uh, so everyone assumes you've got backups uh, until, until you find out that, oh, oh we, we don't? Oh, this is excellent. This is really good. I delegated this all to you, and you didn't do your thing. Um, and if no one knows that they work, monitoring, no one knows how to do the job at the time you actually have a disaster, because at the time you need to use the restore function, isn't a great day. It's not really the day you want to be doing the lookup on how restores work. So there's a whole culture around uh, uh, the whole restoration process that uh, anything you introduce, you should know how to do disaster recovery on before you share it. And you should train and practice. Um, but then the, the bigger question is, well, how might you do it? So we've been working on a thing for the last year and a half called Shield. Um, obviously, being Cloud Foundry people, we, we use it in a Cloud Foundry setting. Uh, it is completely generic. You can use it for, for anything to back up uh, any, anything, run it any way you like, and, and have any different sort of back end. Um, and it's really interesting, and it's working really well for us um, and, and customers and, and a growing number of people who we find out that they're using it because they hang out in, on the Slack channel. So I thought we'd share it. Um, just to, to quickly answer the question of how might you run it, and then we'll get into perhaps how it works and, and that sort of stuff. Um, really, it's, it's that. Thanks to the wonders of Bosch 2, um, we now have this, well, there's a, a branch that we merge soon. As, as soon as, as um, you know, that's the next sort of major version. But this is as simple as, as we can get it to run Shield. Um, and a couple of little uh, sort of patch files you, you might add in if you want to pre-configure things. But there's also a CLI, which we'll talk about, about how to configure you know, Google, for example, as the back end. Um, and, and, and you've got Shield running on a, on a server. Because Shield itself um, is the scheduling engine. So it just needs to be there so it can start the jobs, 3 a.m., whenever it is you want to do backups. And so we'll just a quick sort of visualize it um, with, with the box. So it's, it's both a, a, an a, a, um, a web view, which I'll show, and also a, a running sort of uh, daemon for, uh, for, for running the scheduled jobs, um, which uh, uh, you, know, you or, or systems can set up. So, um, the dashboard looks a bit like this, and you can sort of see the, the visibility of what's been happening. Super important that you can see whether things are working, again, monitoring, and you might want to hook this into to other systems so you can be alerted. Um, at the core is this idea of jobs, sort of a core high-level idea of, of what we're trying to do with Shield. Is, yes, you might want to trigger backups, and you can do that. A little, um, we'll, we'll, we'll show you that. But, you know, it's a fire and forget thing. You want to know that it's going to keep working. The dashboard is going to, and the events are going to show you that it has been working. Not just the whole system, but each job is working. You want to know that it's not. And uh, uh, so each job is sort of like this join table of, of different ideas. So a target is a thing that we want to back up. Whether it's a system component like a Bosch database or Cloud Foundry's database or a service instance database. So there's nothing sort of system level only about this. We've been using Shield. Uh, agent inside of, of Habitat containers and Docker containers and, and all sorts of things to dynamically. So the moment a system component, the uh, moment a service instance is created, it will re-register itself to be backed up. And it will just pop up in, in the Shield dashboard. The store is where we're going to send things. So Google Compute, Amazon S3, uh, Azure's bucket system. And, that's, it, it's a, and we'll talk about plugins. But you can write those for yourself. Um, so it's visible as to how often and when. That's, that's a text string, so to speak. But I mean, there is a, a language for describing uh, the schedule. Retentions, you know, most, most backup, most companies will have some sort of uh, policies around retention. It's one thing to have a policy. It's another thing that people know and can see that it's the right policy. You know, eyes on, on, uh, on this stuff. So it's, it's right up there. Uh, one day probably isn't anyone's retention policy. It just entertained me. And um, 
uh, whether or not, again, visibility. Is this job fundamentally working? Was the last task that this job tried to run, did it work? Don't want to be the IT guy that gets me turning up and you have to tell me that the last six haven't worked. Um, please, don't ever be that person. Now, running these things, uh, you can actually just run them. So either from, there's a whole bunch of different ways. Obviously the schedule works, but there is a little button you can run. And there's a big, uh, uh, is a, a CLI. So for the most part, I'm gonna talk about the CLI because it's sort of the most expressive thing. Um, and there's an API. So I remember when people used to learn about Bosch, they had the Bosch CLI, and they assumed there was no API. I, I don't get it, I never got it. Like if there's a CLI and the thing's over there, it, it has to talk to it somehow. Guess that there's an API. So similarly, shield daemon is over there, your CLI is here, it's talking to it somehow. There is, there is an API. Um, and you could uh, look at that. But the shield CLI is really good and will probably do most of the things you want. So we can look at the jobs and we can trigger a job to run. And this, but I mean this, that you can sort of do this programmatically. If at the time that you're shutting down a service instance or draining uh, your service instance or draining a machine, you could automatically trigger it to do a backup at that time. Um, obviously, we have our, our schedule. We can visibly see what's going on there and, uh, uh, and, and running with the job. None of that's important in the slightest if you don't know how to find the, the backup that best serves you at this point. And so Shield has, the rest restoration is, I guess, the most important feature. That after you do the restoration, you want that system to be off and running again. So different plugins work differently, but uh, here, here you can you know, sort of visibly see it's uh, interactive. I, I'm a fan of interactive CLIs. Because um, if, no, if a CLI is not interactive, it kind of is, because you go through this iterative process of being wrong. So it's interactive in that you get it wrong, go back to help, you get it wrong, you go back to help, you get it wrong, and eventually it works. So it's sort of still interactive, uh, so why not just offer a helpful interactive menu? Um, I'm not sure if anyone from the Bosch 2 CLI team's here, but I'd like that to be interactive. Um, hands up, who likes interactive CLIs? This is completely off the topic, I just, you know. Hands up, who likes to have no interactive features whatsoever, and all the negative connotations I've already given that makes you wrong. <laughs> cool, all right, that was good. Far larger group of people. It's all about how you frame the question. Um, the CLI is great, but really this is super helpful. Now, at this point, um, Shield, Shield is, 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 uh, is only a sort of baker also, it is a, a global thing, so future work might be to, uh, to make it sort of specific to service instances. But at the moment, if you had service instances, only sort of an admin would, would want to look at this. Um, but uh, yeah, so you press the restore button. And it doesn't matter how the thing works, it will go and restore it. All right, so let's have a look at the, the sort of the basic architecture. Um, and this, this pattern, you can imagine for any service. Now, the agent and the database don't need to be co-located necessarily. Uh, it's a useful pattern, because where else are you going to put it? I mean, the agent has to run somewhere. Putting it next to the database, or one of the, one of the nodes of the database is a place. Uh, for some of the plugins, it has to be local. There's a file system plugin. You, you need to access the file system. You <laughs> would want to be on that machine. Um, Postgres agent, so the agent talking to Postgres theoretically could be off a different machine, because it just needs to talk through Postgres. But um, in this example, and, and so sort of many of the ones I use, I put them on the same machine, or the same container, if you're running inside Docker, or in the same sort of Habitat plan, if you're using Habitat. Co-locating them uh, makes, you know, or, or uh, uh, I guess a Kubernetes pod. Um, and in this case, yeah. So it's, it's, what's noteworthy in this diagram is that the agent is the thing that talks to, to Google Compute. The backups are not all coming back to the daemon and then being shipped off in this picture. Um, the daemon is merely the thing that triggers the request to do the backup, or triggers the request to do the, res the, the restore. Um, so a quick look at uh, sort of the details of this sort of join table, the job. There's, again, the two parts. We have the, the target, so we configure each target is going to be a specific thing to be backed up. 
rel and it's going to be relative to, to you know, where this agent is running. Since this agent's running locally, um, I probably don't, in this case, need as many credentials. Often you can run locally without credentials and just say for VCAP or whatever. Um, <laughs> for anyone that looks long enough, and you'll see NGROC, uh, that was me playing on my laptop. So I literally had Shield agent running on my laptop. I had NGROC, which is this remote tunneling thing, coming into my laptop. I had the Shield daemon running somewhere else on the internet, and I was backing up my laptop's database because I thought that was entertaining. Um, and sometimes, you know, because you can deploy this really easily, as I said, with, with Bosch, and it just works. You go, this is awesome. And then you're about to give a talk on it, and you realize, oh, I don't know if I know how it works exactly the way I think it does. And it turned out I was right. I didn't know. And so um, my approach was more painful to me <laughs> and, and all the staff who had to help me uh, point out all the ways in which I got it wrong. So I learned a lot. Um, and the little demo I put together that ended up being these slides, uh, I do want to put together as a little sort of walking through tutorial. Even though that's not how necessarily you're going to run Shield, you're probably just going to use the Bosch jobs um, to run it because it's really simple. But to understand how it works in, in every way is, is going to make you more confident that you understand and then you really expand it and use it uh, in all the ways that's pluggable. We also described, uh, this job also described where we're going to back up to. You might only have described, the, whilst you're going to have a lot of targets for all the different data stores, things you want to back up, Bosch's database, Cloud Foundry's database, um, uh, and all the service instances, you might only have one store being the one bucket where all backups go. If you have uh, you know, policy reasons, you might need more. Um, but that's sort of the join table. And so these... These two things, the, way, the, re the reason this all uh, can work for an arbitrary set of, of data sources and an arbitrary set is uh, the notion of plugins. So here we have the, uh, the, the Postgres one. The reason that Shield knows how to talk to Postgres is it doesn't. It just calls out to a little CLI app. So Shield needs to know nothing. Um, but the Postgres plugin knows how to talk to Postgres. It knows how to call out to PG Dump. It knows how to call out to PG Restore. Uh, and the Google plugin, it knows how to talk to the Google API. Shield doesn't. Uh, so, for example, when the request comes through, agent uh, calls out to the local Postgres CLI, which is unfortunately named similarly to Postgres's own commands, but uh, uh, fortunately, it knows which one to use. And then it calls out to PG Dump. And then it ships it, tarballs it all up. Does it tarball or a BZIP? BZIP. BZIPs it all up, just in case you're specific on that. And then, uh, and then ships it off to Google. And this is what it looks like. I now get to talk at the Google track, because I showed Google's product. Thank you very much. Um, I really like their, their, their uh, dashboard experience. It's actually really nice. Um, the, uh, the credentials thing is kind of a little quirky. Like, you get this JSON file that you sort of walk around with. Um, rather than keys and credentials. But, um, but again, that's only if you're outside. If you're inside the machines, they can sort of access. We can give them a different set of credentials. Uh, they just pass straight through. Um, all right, so when it comes to doing the restore, uh, why did I show this picture? Oh, yeah, so restore, really important. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to do backups. Um, you know, it depends how long you want your job. If you're OK with your job just being until you need to do restore, it's, it's probably fine. What are you working on? Uh, I'm working on a couple of secret things. <laughs> well, one of them, restore. Ah, no, no, it wasn't. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's good to have this. So the, it works in reverse. Um, the agent calls out. The request comes from the daemon. So the CLI talks to the, the API, the daemon. The daemon calls out to the agent because it knows which agent to talk to based on the target. And, uh, and it calls out to Google, the Google CLI, which knows how to talk to Google. Again, plugins, and, uh, and then reverse. With that, unpacks the, the, the bzip file, uh, and then use PG restore. And you can imagine writing a plugin for anything. There are a whole bunch of them that already exist. Um, I'm not 100% sure why they're all clumped together, but I guess some of them do have an overlap. But anyway, it's a little messy. So I've put little icons for your benefit. And mine, pretty much most things I do, uh, my benefit, and hopefully my benefit is your benefit. This helped me. Um, 
So you can sort of see the different uh, uh, places that you can store. If the one you want isn't there, make one. SCP, make a plugin. Doesn't have to go in here. You can put it in your own uh, repo. As long as by the end uh, it becomes a, a binary executable and has, uh, and I'll show you what it needs to look like. Um, and similarly, for the data sources, there's no way that we're close to finishing this list. Um, because when you look at the, the complete contract of what you want to be able to do, you want to be able to do the restore where the system is, is left running correctly at the end. So we were playing around with using the, uh, the file system plugin. The file system plugin uh, copies files. Um, yeah, that's what it does. It uh, copies files into a bzip file. And then restore function unpacks them. It's pretty special. And uh, we thought we could use this for Redis because Redis writes things to the disk, it's all the data's there. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, when you unpack, we do the restore in reverse, you press that restore button, and you unpack. Redis, the process, does not know this, and it will carry on. And so that's not ideal. So we may need to write a Redis plugin, uh, or perhaps a Redis Habitat plugin, because the plugin is gonna need to know how Redis, to talk to Redis to tell it to reload the data or restart or manage that process lifecycle. And that's fine. Like, as long as you, the, the, it's the end-to-end -end function, knowing that pressing restore is going to end up with your system working again, that's the contract. That's more important than whether plugins are easy or hard or lots. Then the plugins are pretty easy to, uh, to write. Um, and they're, they're just, you know, so whether we write them in, they, they, here they're written in Go. But fundamentally, you write them in anything as long as they sort of fit this, uh, this CLI contract of these functions. So, Postgres one, the Google one, see how they look exactly the same. You start to see that they have different you know, configuration. And finally, so just as to, I, you know, when I wrote these slides, I, I, I could have gone into a deep dive on how you write one and everything, but you don't need to know that right now. What you need to know is that you should not go to any more talks after this, except except Kevin's, which is next, um, <laughs> wherever Kevin is talking. You should go to see Kevin. And then you should come and see my Docker talk. So, forget what I just said. You should wait patiently to the end of the conference and then go and, uh, and you know, look at Shield and how you're gonna start backing up and, and restoring stuff. Because it really, it shouldn't take that long. You should have success with it far sooner than, than any cobbled together system you might have, have done. And I've seen some quite horrendous attempts. Uh, Horrendous attempts at backup and restore where they really were only focused on backup. Didn't have great ideas of how they're gonna restore things. Like just taking snapshots. Snapshots are a lot like the file system plugin. It's like saying, yeah, it's over there. How are you gonna restore it? I don't know, I won't be here that hour. <laughs> I will be looking for a job over there. Um, yeah, never, here's a trick. Look through your ticket queue, and if you see two tickets, one called Setup Backups, and the other one says Setup Restores, you should find somewhere else to work. They are not two tickets. <laughs> there is no such thing as a backup ticket. There is a backup and restore ticket. It's like, how do you know the backups are working? I just saw them over there. You know, the restore is the most important part, and corollary that is your team knowing how to do restores is really the, the use case. It's not that there is backup or restore, it's that in the event that we need this, that all the appropriate people know how to do it and with confidence. That's the story. It's as it's much a teaching story as it is a functional story. Lots of different ways. It's just an agent and just plugins. So you could write chef if you want it. You could, you could manually do it like I do on my laptop. A um, Couple of common ones, uh, there's the boss job, which you could use to run co-locate or put anywhere, um, and a growing number of examples. And then uh, there's also a, a Terraform plugin. It's uh, not yet been merged, but uh, Terraform 0 0.10, they're gonna sort of make, there's a huge backlog of tickets for Terraform. And I think they just decided that they had, uh, they wanted to just close them all and say, not our problem. So they're gonna have lots of different repos. So this sort of thing should, should become more uh, accessible, but there's another way to set up Shield. Uh, and obviously, uh, I mentioned Habitat. Habitat's this uh, thing that came out from the people that did Chef. Um, Chef is very old, and we make fun of it. 
that hasn't changed. I mean, you can't fix certain things. It's, it is what it is. Um, but the, the people that did Chef have uh, had, you know, seen the world that we want to solve, and they want uh, to make it really easy to build sort of, of self-organizing um, peering systems. So you want to do Postgres clusters? It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be hard, except if you go to the Postgres Docker image, the canonical one, the underscore slash that one, the one that's the standard. It has all the important description of what Postgres is. Highly available, continuous streaming archives, sounds wonderful. That Docker image can't do any of that. <laughs> because it's hard. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff with etcd or console to form clusters. I've gone off the track, but I have time. Um, then, uh, you know, and you, you start to make up stuff. And thank God for, for etcd, zookeeper, and, 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 and console for the ability to coordinate locking and leader election, those sorts of things. But then you've still got a lot of bespoke code for templating and, and, the, and the whole uh, process of changing the role of, say, Postgres from leader to master to no longer master. That's a very special role. That's called deleting everything. You can't go from was master back to master. That's not a thing. If you're someone else's master now, you need to forget whatever you were. You need to delete everything. The, the, the whole looking after a, of a cluster through its, you know, the 10 years of its life is non-trivial. Um, and so the Habitat is, is, is an attempt to you know, provide hooks and plugins to make that interesting. So we find that really interesting. So Shield is sort of an agent that you can use and just run inside the Habitat plan. So it just runs. Basically, a Postgres will wake up and just start backing itself up. So that's really interesting. Uh, please come and hang out with us in the Shield channel and uh, ask questions, get started, add plugins. Um, finish off if you want to, you know, you think, no, I don't need any more conference. I need some personal time. I just want me and 250 blog posts. That's what I want. There's 250 blog posts. I, I wouldn't read them all. Skip all the ones I wrote. Uh, yeah, no, I'd read all of mine. They're awesome. Um, but yeah, just flick through and see if there's uh, with anything that we had to do that was n just not obvious, that like we just know everyone's going to have the same problem. So we just try to write blog posts uh, to share these ideas. So a lot of them are little tidbits, little tutorials, little stories. Um, want help with Shield or anything else? Please ask us for help. If we can't help you, we'll find someone who can. We'll tell you where to look. Um, and uh, yeah, if you ever have any thoughts whatsoever on Shield backups, the future, um, please come to the Slack channel and hang out. Thank you very much. The Slack channel is on the Cloud Foundry Slack. So you go to Cloud Foundry, so slack.cloudfoundry.com, sign up. Many, many good Slack channels there. Questions? I forgot that I should ask for questions. To service brokers? Um, like I said before, the, the whole Cloud Foundry thing is not really designed. So yes, in the open service broker API world, we could go there as an open service broker channel. We could talk about it from there. Um, my, and a few of us believe that, uh, let's just embed it. So have a restore function. So the Dingo PostgreSQL we did included a few of these ideas, like allow things to be recreated. And then when they wake up, they just automatically restore themselves. Doesn't really have a good idea for point in time, but no. So there are some ideas, and they're the sort of ideas a person would come up with if they didn't want to change Cloud Foundry. Because you want to help everyone that's already got Cloud Foundry. And some of them are pivotal customers or whatever, they have older versions of Cloud Foundry. So to fix Cloud Foundry kind of says, none of you get to be helped. So it's a little bit tortured about that. But yeah, I would like the Service Broker API to be expanded to have first class ideas about backup and restore. All right, so multi-tenant says the other part of it is, is you know, if you, if you owned a service instance that was yours, you had access to it, can we do a, a filtered view on the Shield dashboard that, through the UAA that said, oh, okay, you get to see this one, but none of the others? Yep. Right, so, so Bosch back and restore, I saw the talk, and... Um, so, the, so Bosch Back and Restore has this idea of, all right, let's sort of snapshot Cloud Foundry right now. And so it synchronizes across everything. 
the implementation of each of those little things might be, let's call shield, or let's call the shield daemon to tell it to do something. Um, yeah, someone's, someone's doing something. I mean, James is one of the shield people. He said, yeah, he knows about it. He's looking at it. Oh, you're awesome. Thank you very much.